Hello, my friends. Dr. K here on Saturday, Shabbat, uh, September 28th, 2024. Let me give you a couple of announcements up front. Uh, I've mentioned a couple of times that we're having some technical difficulties. A brief background. I've been on Facebook since 2016. My presence has been increasingly intense since about 2016 because of the rise of Trump and so forth. And without exaggerating and the Lord listening, I've had a knockdown, drag out, sustained battle with Facebook to just stay alive, to stay online. I won't go through the litany of all the times I've been kicked off, restricted, thrown into jail, uh, censored, etc., etc., etc. Some of it is mere algorithm. Uh, I sometimes use words that trigger the little synapses down in there. But a lot of it is political. Everything's political today, beloved. So is Facebook. So is all social media. So I'm not sure I can survive. I spent about two or three hours with my webmaster yesterday trying to get locked back into Facebook. They, for no reason at all, uh, froze my account, my old accounts, and uh, we couldn't get in. So I'm left with one alternative back uh, uh, to get back in the, in the fight, and I ask for your prayers. I'm going to try to create a new page, a new site. Uh, I won't tell you the details yet, but just pray that I can get my presence back on Facebook because I have literally uh, thousands of folks that I can reach that way, and that's the main idea. Um, so anyway, uh, that's the background. I'm not on Facebook yet, but maybe, God willing, and the creek don't rise, and um, maybe by Monday evening we'll be back on. I can start posting my stuff there. Right now you can access all my stuff um, on, um, on my website, uh, and on YouTube, uh, also on Vimeo to some extent. So you can get the full, full stuff there, especially on my website. It's got everything on there. It's free. Uh, it, uh I got to figure out, I'm going to have to give you the, I'll put, I'll make sure the website address is at the bottom of the, uh, the printed, uh, the printed part of this. Okay. Let's go. Father in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Never a dull moment following the Messiah in the year 2024 or any other year for that matter, but I praise you and I thank you. And I have to remind myself when I get down in the mouth a little bit, you're sovereign and nothing will happen to us so long as we're staying in your lane. Uh, nothing will happen to us without your permission. So my sense is you're forcing my hand a little bit in anticipation of what's coming next year to make some adjustments. Almost heard uh, you say in the on the way back from Starbucks today um, something like hunkering down, latching down, uh, tightening the bolts, that sort of thing. Not exaggerating, sir. I think we're all being made ready for what's coming. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about that again today. Holy Spirit, take this thing over completely. Make sure that the content is accurate, my tone is proper, and please, Lord, I always make some mistakes minimize them to the extent that that's possible in Jesus name. Amen. It's a happy uh, occasion for me today. You'll see it in the title. Notes on peace to the Peloton. Peloton is the name that we've been given and given to us for this little loose knit online fellowship on four different platforms. It's going to be changing to a little bit more formal name, especially if I form a new page to the um, Confessing Peloton Fellowship. CFP, uh, confessing meaning our, our honoring and hearkening back to the confessing church of Germany in World War II, headed up by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Karl Barth, and several others. Anyway, here's the, here's the title, Notes on Peace to the Peloton, Forming Ranks for the Coming American Storm over, this is the part that just blew me away because it's only in the last Mm, week or two that I was reminded of something I'd read years ago. Let me start all over. I get kind of pumped about this. Notes on peace to the Peloton. Forming ranks for the coming American storm over true religion versus civil religion. Some of you have read a little bit about civil religion. I'm going to take that thing to the mat today and to clarify some historical distortions we've been taught about America and her founding. So I'll probably upset and ruffle some feathers again. That's never my intent, but truth uh, has, has a way, not me, but the, the content of God's teaching has a way of doing that. Theology, the scripture for today is James 3, 18 in the Amplified. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness 
parenthetically, spiritual maturity, is always sown in peace by those who make peace by actively encouraging goodwill between individuals. Now that's a little bit, God, you know, the word of the Lord. Uh, I'm sorry, I get it. Sorry, Father. I get so pumped, I get ahead of myself. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. My apologies to you, sir. Um, that sounds so innocuous, so tame, so nice, so polite, so gentle, so soft. But what it really says is, if you're going to sow seeds of righteousness and truth, <laughs> uh, and encourage goodwill toward truth between individuals, y'all going to be in for a kerfuffle or ten. Anyway, a key term, righteousness, from, I'm not sure I can pronounce this in the Greek, dikaisune, I apologize to all you Greeks out there for messing it up, uh, from a root word meaning equity of character. I'm going to stop right there. I would be exhilarated to hear the American pulpits begin to ring out with a cry toward moral character and integrity. Character and integrity. Not, you know, this is, well, I'm not even going to go into the litany again. Here's the reason. By the definition of what righteousness is, according to the biblical text, equity of character, that is, refers to that which is holy, just, and right. Is that being taught in your churches? Is it? Impartial, proper, or fit includes the idea of kindness, graciousness, and liberality, uh, freedom of Christian conscience uh, on the non-absolutes. The state of him who is such as he ought to be, the condition acceptable to God and no other. Justice, and the key here, of righteousness, and why God loves justice, and I do too, and you should as well, Justice, or the virtue which gives each one his due. I want everybody to get their fair due. I want them to get good stuff. But I don't want the real bad guys to get the good stuff while the good guys are being whooped. Don't want that. Neither does God. Also refers to purity of heart and rectitude of life and lifestyle. Conformity of heart and life to the divine law. But, Dr. Kelly, we're not under the law. Boy. The law will never go away. The law is eternal. The law is precious. The law is our rudder. The law is the truth of God in Christ Jesus, who is the truth, Christ Jesus. I love the law. David said it over and over again in the Psalms. I love thy law. I do too. No, I don't live under it in the same way in the Old Testament, but I, I honor it. I bow to it. I, I try to follow it, but only by the power of the Holy Spirit as the word of God is revealed to me in everyday life. Oh, all right. Quotation. Uh, I did most of my master's work on John and Bobby, uh, John F. Kennedy and, and Robert F. Kennedy back in the 1960s. They were my political heroes. I've been a political junkie since I was 11. I've told that story before about my dad. Ruined me forever in a, in a wonderful way, I think. Um, and so this is from Robert F. Kennedy's Ripple of Hope speech on the day of affirmation at University of Cop Cape Town, South Africa, June 6th, 1966. He was killed precisely to the day, assassinated June 6th, 1968. We were campaigning for him at the time. Long story behind about what that did to me personally and my generation when they killed Bobby and they killed Martin and then Jack. Before then, we kind of went nuts. Here's the quote. Brilliant man who did not start carrying a, a toot about civil rights, but both Jack and Bobby, having met with Martin and other civil rights leaders, they quickly caught fire for civil rights. Anyway, here's the quote from South Africa. Few will have the greatness to, I love this line, few of us will have the greatness to bend history itself, but each of us can work to change a small portion of events. So true. It is from numberless diverse acts of courage and belief that human history is shaped. Each time a man stands up for an ideal, or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. I love that passage. It would square with any biblical notion that you might come up with. 
commentary from Charles Ellicott, this time writing in 1878. Excuse me. Uh, I've lost my place. Oh yeah, here we go. He elaborates, And the fruit of righteousness, better thus slightly altered, and fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by them that make peace. And peace can only be brought by truth. There's no other way. They shall be called the children of God who do so, Matthew 5, 9. Their fruit is hidden in the precious seed, but the times of refreshing will come from it. Although many times it comes later, almost all the time comes later, after some battles over the truth. As whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap, Galatians 6, 7. You sow to peace, you sow to truth, you sow to character, you sow to honor, you sow to honesty, you sow to the virtues. You'll end up getting that from the Lord's kingdom, but not necessarily from the kingdom of Satan, obviously. He goes on, God's chastening of the truly repentant, excuse me, the truly penitent, yields with it a like promise afterwards of the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Penitence. It's, a, it's an ongoing thing. It's not, okay, I made a mistake in 1938, and I'm going to say I'm sorry one time, and you're good to go. Penitence is an ongoing discipline. I've told you about it before. If I'm riding in the car, and I do or say or think some wrong things, and it's obvious to me, I, only, I know God's already there. And I'll just mutter or whisper, Lord, I'm sorry about that. Um, let's, let's go after this, and then I'll move to pleasanter things that are more pleasing to him as I go about my, da my daily business. He concludes, peace comes, da, 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 da. peace comes at length. See, here it is. If you're going to sow to peace and truth and honor and character, Ellicott understood it in 1878. I don't know if our churches do anymore. Peace comes at length, though life be full of pain who sow it. Calm in the faith of, faith of Christ, however, I lay me down. Pain for his sake is peace, a peaceful conscience. And loss is gain for all who bear the cross shall wear the crown. See, these are the old verities. These are the old understandings and the interpretations of Christian orthodoxy almost vanished from the larger churches in America today. It's just... It's as if some great wind came and blew it out. I'll name that wind again before I'm done today. Teaching, section two. Here I have the joyous occasion to praise God and the character and need of a few of our own in this Peloton Confessing Fellowship after Kelly uh, fell off the, 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 the not, well, doctrinal uh, personality wagon for a bit. I'm not gonna go through all that. That former fractures are on the accelerated men you know, I, I'm, if I seem joyous while in the middle of a, a different kind of ma a digital maelstrom, it's because we're, form we're reforming as a unit again, and, and God's doing it, and certain individuals who had the character to forgive the old man, correct him pretty sternly, and then forgive him, and each of us helping each other to get back on that narrow road, which is Christ the King. Um, I was going to name them, but I know their character. They wouldn't want to be named in public. So I'm going to... Uh, John Lewis, the, the late black congressman who was instrumental in the civil rights movement, is talking about the Kennedys uh, decades ago. I love the man. He had a phrase that he would use in intervals. You know, he, he was always stirring up trouble, sowing seeds of righteousness for civil rights and truth and honor and character. And one of the interviews at one point at several points said, uh, Congressman Lewis, you, you, you're making a lot of trouble. And he said, yes, I am. That's my purpose, to make good trouble. So I'm going to make some good trouble today. I'm going to stir some good gossip. I'm, gonna, I'm only going to give you the initials of these people, and then you can go chitty-chatting and guessing who they might be. They will know, but you probably won't. Their initials are who, who were instrumental in making this unity come back together that's still going on. Uh, first, we give all credit to God. And then these followers, R, D, M, F, and L, S. That's all. That's all you get. And many others of you who are fervently interceding, we are moving rapidly toward, indeed, a forming of ranks. The Peloton 
is a, a, a cycling term. It is a strategic formation that cyclists form to cut down windage to also strategize on how to win and how to uh, uh, win the race in stages. And I have this picture. If I create a new site, it's awesome. It's got a picture of a peloton blurred, just moving fastly, moving quickly as, as for me, a model of the, the remnant church, the true body of Christ, moving forward in a kind of a V shape. What was the point of that? Forming ranks. Their ranks are tight. Their ranks are tight. They're not scattered all over. Like kids would ride bikes, like we used to in, in the old days, 50s. Their ranks are tight. Their ranks are tight. And that's what's beginning to happen again with us. And I can't thank God and my dearest friends for helping that to happen. A forming of ranks, which is defined in military terms by a line of soldiers standing side by side, shoulder to shoulder in an ordered formation. This in order to become an integral part of God's remnant army for the great spiritual battle that lays ahead for all of us, whether we're prepared or not. My whole point is to help to get us ready. Two types of unity. I want to mention this. Um, well, I got to go. <laughs> go as fast as I can. Uh, yeah, we're good. Two types of unity. The key lesson here uh, in all of this is that there is only one kind of unity that can prevail in the struggles ahead and the ones we have now. Only one kind of struggle versus one that shall surely not only fail, but be the, the destruction of many so-called Christians who follow after it. I'll elaborate in a bit. To make this important distinction, I turn to an excellent essay by pastor and Bible scholar Bob DeWay, writing all the way back in 2005, uh, almost 20 years ago, who wrote a piece called True and False Unity. First point, gives us a microcosm. He gives us a, a case study, an illustration of what true and false unity is like and what it does to people. I'll read snippets. He writes, I need some advice. I have been told that I am a bad influence on the congregation, that I am dividing the body of Christ. What happened was that our pastor decided to change the church to the seeker-sensitive model. This model, by the way, I have a parenthetical, was begun by somebody named Donald McGavran, graduate of Fuller Theological Seminary, or a professor there, I don't know which, or both, in a book called The Bridges of God, published in 2005. That's where the trouble most recently started. He no longer preaches the gospel. The sermons are watered down and have little biblical content. What Bible is used is used from a paraphrase. You heard me go on a rant. I hate the paraphrases. Fun to read for little babies and beginners, but not for the mature. So he said the same thing a long time ago in a place far, far away. What Bible is used is from a paraphrase Bible. The music is more entertainment than worship. Everything has changed. Let me stop right there. Pause. Selah. Beloved, in American church life, since 2005 at least, everything has changed, hasn't it? And for those of you who don't think so, you're in trouble. I need to get back on track. Uh, when I asked the pastor about it, he told me these changes were necessary for the church to reach new people and grow. Not to save them, but to grow, it's called the growth model. To have more butts in the pews. To have more income via the tithe and offerings. He goes on, I was saved in this church and have supported it for many years. I do not want to be divisive. But see, truth divides. Jesus said it. I'll quote it a little bit later. I do not want to be divisive, but it doesn't seem right that Bible teaching and gospel preaching have been removed from the church. 2005, he asked the question, what shall I do? I've been trying to instruct myself and us about what Jesus expects of us in these days of apostasy and antichrist. Second, crisis. We're in the midst of a radical change, there it is again, in evangelicalism all the way back in 2005 that has left countless Christians starving for God's word. You've written me notes about it in their churches. Proponents of the change have labeled as are have been labeled as divisive those who resist the movement away from gospel preaching and bible teaching 
Opponents of the change are declared judgmental and selfish Pharisees. I've been called Pharisee for 10 straight years now. Never was before. And are told that they should be more loving toward others and quit hanging on to their old ideas about church and theology and doctrine. In short, the troublemakers are told that they must embrace the new paradigm or leave. Some of you have experienced that. A lot of you. At issue is the true nature of real Christian unity. And whatever this other stuff is, that ain't it. Though they may have loving parties and gatherings and, you know, a lot of smiles and hugs and kumbaya. Are we unified by God's work of grace that converted us, giving us the unity of the Spirit with all true Christians? Or, he writes, are we unified organizationally with what he calls the corporate vision of the new paradigm change agents? Starting in 2005 at least. His thesis, biblically defined unity is a gospel-centered unity. Truth-centered unity. John 17, 17 through 21. Not in the text. Go look it up. When Jesus said in his high priestly prayer, O oh, Father, you and I are one. Unify them and make them one with us by the what? by the love of the saints, by the gatherings we have, by the gathering together, by the wonderful, by the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help us, God. True unity then. He goes on to the next point. Paul exhorted the Philippians to be standing firm in one spirit with one mind. Now, well, let me finish it. I'll come back with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. When you are of one mind, I teach on worldview, or at least used to, it's in the book. Uh, when we talk about mindedness, worldview, we're talking about how we think, and how we think has got to be based on the book of books. It can't be based on pastor's teaching, it can't be based on my teaching, it can't be based on your feelings, and the extent to which you feel the goosebumps of the Holy Ghost 14 times a day. It has to be based on the rock of salvation, on the rock of sound doctrine, on the rock of the gospel, which is Christ himself, the living, breathing word of God, written in this book for our understanding and grasp of it. Um, it goes on, the book of Philippians is filled with passages that show Paul's passion. There's the word. Paul's passion for the gospel. I used the metaphor the last time out on Thursday to have a magnificent obsession for God and his truth. I didn't have it for 35 years. I was saved, filled with the Spirit, taught in Christian institutions for decades. But the real passion, the fire, didn't come till much later, starting in 2016. When, ironically, I don't know if this is God's model or not, but buckle up when God started taking away all the accoutrement, all the stuff that I'd been taught by the cultural church, and all the security, and all the money, and all the big offices, and all the accoutrement. And when I was left with almost nothing except Jesus, he lit a fire there, then. And it hasn't gone out since, I don't think. And I give him the, it's, when it's done right, it's his fire. When it's done wrong, it's, my stinky fire. Um, he goes on to finish that graph. Christian unity starts with the gospel, starts with the truth, and ends with the resurrection from the dead for those who have joined Paul in seeing the super, sur, surpassing value of knowing Christ and his sufferings. You can't have one without the other. Next point, false unity. We saw that in the New Testament, true unity is gospel-centric, truth-centric. The false unity that is being promoted today is 20 years ago. Is that right? 15, 20, almost 20 years ago. Promoted today is not like that. In most cases, again, he says it is unity under a religious leader's vision. The pastor has a vision. Uh, I, I see there's a very famous, gifted, talented, female Christian singing artist 
who had this kind of vision when she was a kid. I had this vision when I was 15. This is the pastor now, a mythical pastor. I saw my church burgeoning with tens of thousands of people. I saw this and I saw that. And everything that followed that vision was a strategic effort to make that vision come to pass. <laughs> we only have one vision, beloved. It's in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go therefore and preach the gospel to all the nations, baptizing them in the Holy Spirit and teaching the ways of Jesus. That's our vision. It hasn't changed. And you shall love the Lord thy God with all your heart and all your mind and all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. These are the two greatest commandments. That's our vision. That's our commission. That's our charge. It has never changed until men came along and changed it. For which they shall be held accountable. Not by me or you or us, except we speak to our pastors and leaders who are veering from orthodoxy and we talk to them about it as best we can. Most of the time they won't receive us. Therefore, there is no true Christian unity unless it is grounded in gospel truth of Christ. There just isn't. There just isn't. False unity then. Vision is not the same as biblical usage. It is used in a modern marketing sense. That's where this growth model, this secret sensitive growth model came from. Marketing. We barred from the business boys. And relates to the leader's mental image of what he wants the product and corporation to look like in the future. The wisdom of business gurus has been mined by Christian leaders since that time who have created, how do you think we got mega churches? who have created religious versions and visions to help pastors market the church. Market the church. I could name a number of pastors who basically went out, you'll know their names, and surveyed the neighborhood, surveyed the city. What would you like to see the church look and sound like? And they built the church on that. God help them. So the problem that he points out is when this vision has to do with converting a Bible church into anything else, there is an inevitable clash. Clash of visions. Clash of worldviews. Clash of theologies. Clash of brother against brother and mother against son and son against daughter and, and on and on and on. Jesus foretold of all of it. I'm understanding it finally more clearly. Conclusion, Jesus said, and here's the passage that I wanted to quote that we've all heard, but now in that context, I think it makes a lot more sense in his context. Jesus said about all this, do you suppose that I came to grant peace on the earth? I tell you, no, but rather division. And it goes on and on, but how families and friends and Christians will be divided. Some wanting truth, a tiny minority, a remnant, and the rest not. The gospel is divisive when preached to the unregenerate. <laughs> and I add to that the unregenerate and the rebellious inside God's house. It's called the great falling away. Those who respond in faith are divided from those who reject it. Christian unity is unity under the and through the gospel again. It is created by only God when he regenerates people and makes them in one spirit and they stay in regeneration and sanctification. But you no, Dr. Kelly, Jesus said no one can take my me, uh, take me out of his hand. That's right. But you can, you can, you can retreat, you can depart, you can backslide and then apostatize. Yeah, you can. All the great theologians believe that. Or, no, that's not true. About a third of the great theologians, the other two thirds will believe that you, there's nothing you can do. I'll talk a little bit more about that as I close. He goes on. It is nurtured through the teaching of my favorite phrase, sound biblical doctrine. I love that phrase. It is the bedrock of the real church. And it's honored by people who metaphorically pick up their Bibles and kiss the Bible. They kiss the Word of God. 
as if they were offering a holy kiss to the Messiah himself. Like David, who loved the truth and who loved justice, I love thy law. Sound biblical doctrine that has as its goal the unity of the faith. False unity is unity that is demanded and prescribed by religious leaders to their own ideas and organizations. This is the unity that the religious leaders of Israel wanted long ago and that Jesus threatened when he brought the truth. His gospel divided their religious system and spoiled their unity. Here's the line I want you to remember for your own sakes. And so they decided they had to get rid of them. Pause. Selah. They decided to get rid of Jesus. They had to get rid of him. He threatened the establishment order. That has come to us again. I'll say more about it as I close. But y'all need to get ready for them to want to get rid of you as well. Some of you are already experiencing it. The real gospel will divide churches as well if they are not based on the true gospel itself. Those who promote, promote pure gospel preaching are in, in a minority today now, are the friends of Christian unity. Those who promote man-centered vision for their religious systems are enemies of Christian unity. Be encouraged, therefore, in your support of the true gospel. The Bible says that if you do so, no matter how much you are maligned, you are pleasing to Christ and a fragrance to him by doing so. Philippians 1.27. I have a note here of all that the Bible scholar that I just quoted wrote here to restate it. To get rid of him is the one you should remember and pray about and ask God to get you ready for that kind of possibility. No? Not an absolute possibility. Severe warning to those of us who resist false unity today in 2024 in America. In all of its hideous forms in the American church and American politics today. Third, final section. Oh, maybe not the final. I got to get going here. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. The political church. I've got so much to cover, but a lot of it's new for me. And uh, I want to share it with you. As I reviewed the rather expected analyses of the currently and toxically politicized American church under the rubric of Trump Christian nationalism, I was astounded to find a historical piece that just ripped the, more scales off my eyes. Hmm. He talks about, he's a scholar, but I think of from the humble pen of a Catholic high school history teacher. God does choose the least of these to confound the wise and the powerful. He talks about something called American civil religion. I read about it 20, 30 years ago. I didn't pay it much mind. I want you to hear this today. Once more, I crossed the Protestant lines of scholarship to the pen of a Catholic high school history teacher. No, it's not an endorsement of all the religious rights of the Catholic Church, but I'll take truth wherever I can find it. And this young man had a big chunk of it. His article, The Politicization of the er of Early American Christianity. We thought it started with Jerry Falwell in 1979. I've taught that. Listen to this. Overview. The Politicization of Early American Christianity, 1760s to the 1890s, examines the role that civil religion played in American society during the time frame of 1760 to 1899. Five watershed moments are the springboard for this. I'll, I'll mention them as I move more into this discussion of civil religion versus real religion, Christian religion, ultimately caused America's identity to be mistakenly conceived as Christian from the get-go. We've never been a Christian nation, beloved. Many of you know that, but I'm going to give it to you in chapter and verse and data why that's so. Roots, many philosophical thinkers. I, I'm glad I got a PhD in philosophy instead of a, a doctor of divinity where all I would study was, was theology and nothing more. This way I get to study theology and philosophy. The, the great philosophies of men. <clears throat> Our source of side, uh, said, you know, um, Robert F. Kennedy said that history is driven by, you know, a million little, I think it was Bush 
number one, who said points of light. History is driven by great ideas, great philosophies, bad ones and good ones. Many philosophical thinkers, John Locke, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, especially him, Montesquieu. I read most of these on my year sabbatical back in the 1980s at Regent University, influenced American political thought. But it was Jean-Jacques Rousseau, both actively and possibly, who held the greatest sphere of influence on American governance, specifically our political identity. It wasn't so much Locke. It wasn't just Montesquieu. And, and uh, oh, there's several names that escaped me that I studied. Unlike his colleagues and predecessors, such as John Locke, brilliant, Montesquieu and others who focused exclusively on morality, this is where the change began. Rousseau was interested in how these ideals, natural law, nature, morality, affected not so much how it compared with sound doctrine, but how it impacted society. All of a sudden, boom, we have pragmatism, political and theological pragmatism born early in our American adventure. He went on to establish something called the social contract, which is the notion of civil religion, an ideology that had a profound impact on the identity of American politics, specific Christian doctrine and Americans' very identity that combined politics and some of the Bible and wedded it together. But it wasn't Christian, beloved. It wasn't Christianity. It wasn't Jesus. I'll talk a little bit more about what it is as I close. Again, civil religion. Then Rousseau defined civil religion this way. The glue that holds society together, or more specifically, it is a way to bring unification in a nation by giving it guidelines to follow that were human, beloved, more than they were biblical and doctrinal. Rousseau argued that this idea of civil religion, which he defined also as public piety, guidelines, as essential for the virtuous society. In order for society to flourish, there must be a moral standard, not the biblical moral standard so much, as the one we would author and pen and construct as moral guidelines that the society and its order must follow, so that the society won't go into chaos. In some ways, Rousseau was smarter than Jesus, or so he thought. Religion, considered in relation to society, may divide it up in two kinds. This is what Rousseau wrote. The religion of man and that of the citizen. Furthermore, Rousseau argued that the dogmas of civil religion ought to be few, simple, and exactly worded without explanation or commentary. To Rousseau, Christianity was a religion occupied solely with heavenly things. What we needed is a more earthly religion, which Jean-Jacques Rousseau was glad to start to give us. The existence, Rousseau went on, the existence of a mighty, intelligent, and beneficent divinity. This is him writing now, not about Jesus. Divinity, capital D, possessed with foresight and providence. There's that famous classical founder's word. The life to come, the happiness of the just, the punishment of the wicked. Those who distinguish civil from theological intolerance are, to my mind, mistaken. The scriptures and the gospel were too confining for Rousseau, and the founders were gobbling him up. Rousseau's main argument was that civil religion placed its importance not on heaven or hell, but on the betterment of society. Not on heaven or hell, but on the betterment of society. What this is, as I write in my book and I taught for decades, is a classical definition of something called deism. Deism, not Christian uh, uh, theism, deism. And even if the, Christian, the, the founders were Christian, they were following a lot of Rousseau and the other classical thinkers. They didn't talk so much about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, but on his providence, on his governing concepts on natural law all these things that were taught that are sound wonderful but they did not represent jesus the christ five impacts gotta hurry the main ideas that make up civil religion are not expounded upon <laughs> rousseau leaves them without any afterthought or definition or explanation he says all this stuff and it says okay you now you go out and define it for yourselves Rousseau did this on purpose, the writer says. He explicitly gives the reader instruction that the terms are to be, here it is, here it is, hold, hold, hold on, 
Hold on to your seats. They're to be subjectively defined. Subjectively defined. Rousseau's ideas ultimately had an impact on five major watershed events in America's founding that I will refer to and augment with what I consider to be gaping fractures in our foundation. One, the drafting of the First Amendment of the Constitution. Two, the Second Great Awakening. Three, the Nativist Movement. Four, that's a big one right now today. Four, the Civil War and Slavery. And five, religious pluralism and American myths. We've been taught myth after myth after myth about how Jesus-like we are, how Christian we are, how the most accurate thing could be said, and I'll close on this note, is America has been a religious nation, a largely secular religious nation. Foundational fractures then. The, for, the framers, I'm not sure I'm going to make it. Yeah, I will. Yeah, I will. Uh, foundational fra The framers of the Constitution were influenced by and borrowed from Enlightenment ideologies. Uh, Francis Schaeffer's uh, 10 stages of history I used in my classes uh, the Enlightenment uh, era, 18th century, you can check me on that. Uh, da, 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 da. Enlightenment ideologies influenced by, influenced by Locke, Montesquieu, and other philosophers, those ideologies focus more on civil liberties from which we get our obsession with freedom as the world and political philosophy defines it, but not freedom as Jesus defines it. I'm, I'm not splitting hairs here. I'm making distinctions that I've been thinking about for 40 years or more that are now becoming clear to me. Rousseau's work proved highly influential in the creation of the First Amendment, for example, as well as Thomas Jefferson's ideology regarding separation of church and state. Furthermore, scholar Stephen Green argues that, and I quote, civil religion was so deeply intertwined with revolutionary, revolutionary ideology that it seems virtually impossible to distinguish between them. The revolution and civil religion, not Jesus' Christianity were wedded together. And ever since that happened in 1776, and even a bit before, we have been sold a bill of goods, I know I have, that all of this was Jesus. <sighs> Take a deep breath here. I know I'm not going to be, I'm not, my numbers are dropping. I'm not popular already, but I think of Dr. Norman Geisler, the one voice generations ago who said the Revolutionary War was not Christian. Dr. Norman Geisler, regarded then as one of the top most brilliant theologians in America. I thought he was nuts back in the day. I don't think so anymore. The Founders' conception of church-state relations was heterodox. I'll define that in a minute dynamic and incomplete, and purposefully so. And by 1800, the United States represented the only secular government on earth, secular, revolutionary France accepted. America and France, the two great revolutions. We always make the distinction, oh, the French Revolution was bloody and godless, and yeah, but ours, oh my goodness, ours was, it was Jesus all the way, it was, yeah. Was it now? Was it now? Conclusion, what was advocated for by civil religion was not a strict theocracy. Now, the forces of Trump are trying to bring us back to that. And um, rather a shared United States in which many beliefs and customs are welcomed. And that presents a paradox, a conundrum. If a nation is going to be unified in Christian truth, then it has to, pretty much almost has to be a theocracy, except that's not the founder's intent at all. And I might, I might want to say rightly so. They tried that at Plymouth Landing, and theocracy didn't work at all, especially after they started slaughtering the Indians who attacked them because they weren't living up to their agreement. So I know I sound like a leftist. I sound woke. I'm not woke. I'm awakened, beloved. Big difference. I don't have a political... I don't give a rip about political ideology anymore or political philosophy. What I care about, radically so, is what's in the book. Finally, with the growth of nationalism, he's writing this in 2005, beloved. 
I just think that's extraordinary. Finally, with the growth of nationalism, pluralism, and modernism, it is likely that civil religion will soon include a host of new religious and non-religious identities and cults. 20 years ago. If you are listening closely, we have here the very roots of American disorder, beloved. Enlightenment deism permitting slavery, Native American policy, the theft of Mexico, Freemasonry, just to name a few. If it was Jesus-centered, none of that would have been done. None of it that I have been writing about for the past year or more clearly defined than before. The heart of such disorder is found in the very core, the idea of heterodoxy. So let me close with an article by Jono Martin in his blog, Geo Jono, published August 31, 2017. This is excellent and it tightens our, our focus. Orthodoxy, he defines rightly so as the true and correct teachings of scripture, the real gospel, the real deal. In my position, he writes, orthodoxy is the body of teachings of the evangelical church. Okay. So far as it corresponds to the truth of Scripture, that's why I'm a truth guy, beloved. It always will be till I got no more breath. And then afterwards, when I have a different kind of breath, then never mind. The belief that Jesus is fully God at the basis of our orthodox belief. Two, heterodoxy. Here's what gets really interesting and mucky. Heterodoxy. Beliefs or teachings that differ from orthodoxy, but not so much as to be categorized, categorized as heresy. It's off-center. It's off. It's not the real, real deal, but it won't send you to hell. Those who hold to heterodox beliefs are still within the fold of Christ. They're saved, though they are mistaken about some non-essential issues that are becoming more and more essential today. The age-old debate, for example, between Calvinism or Monergism, God alone regenerates. I am not a, a fan of that. It's not just him. I'm probably leaning, I'm a combination, but I lean more to the Armenian view of synergism where it's God and man in partnership. for The, re, the Holy Spirit regenerates, but we have to say yes. I'm already in trouble, so why not? Heresy, now the third and final category. These are beliefs or teachings that differ, that differ, that differ remarkably at root to such a degree that they can no longer be called beliefs of Christianity. Those who hold these beliefs properly understood fall well outside of the fold of Christ and they are not saved. Though they may be a pastor, a leader, a priest, a prelate, a pope, and call themselves Christian leaders, they are not saved. The belief that Jesus did not physically die on the cross, for example, uh, docetism, uh, uh, an old heresy, is an example of a heretical view. I bring it up to date for you, and here I'm going to get in more trouble. Thus, I believe these are now cult-like, non-orthodox belief systems that have replaced Jesus and the canon and the gospel. Christian nationalism, the QAnon conspiracy cult, the prosperity gospel, reconstructionist dominionism, and the new apostolic reformation movement, just to name a few. These will lead to hellfire, I believe. I could be wrong, but I believe they can and almost inexorably shall if people stay on those roads. The question, now then, do you believe that America and her church fall mostly into the region of orthodoxy, heterodoxy, or heresy? I'm going to close on this and then I'm going to leave town. I don't have enough time to get it all, so you'll have to read it. I have a scripture that just came to me in this teaching, so... Ah! And I didn't even cite it. This is from the book of Daniel. I'll give you the reference before I finish. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything, and like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. You're familiar with this vision. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. 
See where I'm going. My answer. Therefore, after nearly 10 years of research, and especially for this study, I draw the following proposals, tentative conclusions. One, America's foundations were fatally fractured from the time of their origins, having never been set in firm Christian doctrine, but rather in a syncretistic mix that smacks and smells and tastes to me a whole lot like deism. Second, Daniel's vision, and I'll give you the reference in the written form. I'm also convinced that America, not Rome, fulfills the letter to the uh, fulfills the very letter of the fourth kingdom shown to the prophet Daniel on behalf of King Nebuchadnezzar in the sixth century BC. This because of our own mixed feet of iron and clay central to the nature of that fourth kingdom that will be headed by Antichrist. And I see them both on scene. Third, Antichrist and Babylon, therefore the great. And I, as a number of other scholars, have concluded the historic intersect between the rise of Donald Trump to the presidency of the United States, I think is the fourth kingdom, combined with his plans to turn America into a fourth Reich, comports perfectly with the fulfillment of both the prophecies of Daniel and John the Apostle's description of Babylon the Great in the book of Revelation, chapter 17 and 18, which I've quoted three times now. Codicil. To this firm expectation, as I've said, increasingly only in the last month, Prepare, therefore, because the years 2025 to 2030 shall figure prominently in the actual manifestation of all the events of the eschaton, or its beginning. I believe this is accurate and responsible forecasting. I'm not a prophet. I just read and I think and I assemble and I pray and reflect and keep on digging. That's my sense. All of which leads me to urge you all, starting with my own household, make ready for what's ahead. Make ready for persecution of the remnant church. I think that's the most responsible thing I could ever tell you instead of, oh, it's going to be great. America's been through this sort of thing. Again. It's going to be great. Buy your houses. Go on vacations. You know, have fun. Party, party, party. As I've outlined in my book, The Sixth Seal Two, this includes preparing ourselves spiritually, financially, and physically. Roz Downer, a retired professional uh, therapist and counselor, talks exquisitely about these three necessities to get ready for what's coming. Spiritually, financially, and physically, we've got decisions to make for these years of trouble just in front of us. What the Apostle Paul called perilous times in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 13. Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, perilous times are going to come. And then there's this exquisite and detailed explanation of what that is. We're there. We're here. We're at the very front of the eschaton. We're, we're there. We're, we're bumping up against it. To do anything less than prepare, beloved, is vastly beyond foolishness, but rather to dishonor the very king who commanded for us to endure to the end with the knowledge of what America is and what she is not. And so I'm going to hold up a picture that's going to inflame outrage. This is what I think America is becoming based on the evidence, the history and the theology. This is what we are becoming. This is what we are becoming. Father, in the name of Jesus, I don't know that I've been too shocking, but I study and I read and I pray and I study and I study and I try to listen to your leading. And more and more and more and more, I understand why America is so off-center. Because of our origins, because of what happened a long time ago. Our trajectory was almost cursed from the beginning, despite all the myths and the pretty stories. And I'm not cursing America. I'm trying to show her for what she is rapidly becoming. You told me to do this. I hope I've done it well enough and documented it well enough that you are pleased with it. Where I've made mistakes, I'm sure they will point them out. But Father, I give this to you now as the best I can do. I ask you also with these good people to help me get back on Facebook, if that's your will, so that I can reach more people before night comes and the lights turn out.
I'm trying to get it out there as much as I can, and I desperately need the prayers of the saints to help me pry open those doors. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you guys very much. See you next time.